All right, so this is a video of the answers to the pretests that we took this week. So starting with number one, minnow number one is in the mica family. There's two different micas we've seen this semester. This is biotite or muscovite. The other one that is dark, that is black, is biotite. So this is muscovite. It has basal cleavage, so it's very good cleavage. Really important rock forming mineral. And so it definitely has cleavage. Very soft, fingernail soft, you can scratch it with your fingernail. And this is muscovite. This mineral here has cleavage, and it's probably the most cleaved mineral of all. Comes in a variety of colors. This is fluorite. Fluorite will not scratch glass, even though there's a piece of glass right next to it. It's nowhere near hard enough to scratch glass, so it's a fairly soft mineral. And fluorite comes in a variety of colors. It loves to form little octahedron prisms. And so this is, answer number two is fluorite. Number three has a little bright pink plaque right next to it, reacts to acid. So any mineral or any rock that reacts to acid is always going to have calcite in it. This is almost a pure form of calcite. This is the mineral calcite. It reacts under hydrochloric acid. It has 6120 cleavage, so it's not really cubic. You can see it's kind of offset here a little bit. So this is what we call 6120 cleavage. This mineral has cleavage on three sides. A very important rock forming mineral, and this is calcite. Moving to number four. This is pyrite, also known as fool's gold. Very heavy. Even though this mineral has crystals, the crystals actually form when this mineral is in the molten state. If you were to hit this with a hammer though, it would not form cleavage, it would not form geometric shapes upon breaking it. It would fracture randomly, so this mineral does not have cleavage. This composition is iron and sulfur. It is a very black streak, very heavy, very high specific gravity, and this is pyrite, also known as fool's gold. Number five, generally people will taste these during normal times, but in this particular case, number five, does have a salty taste. We don't encourage people to do the salty taste with the uh, coronavirus still in our myths and the variants. This is almost a translucent to transparent mineral. It is 90 degree cleavage, cleavage in three different directions, both the sides, the top and the bottom. Will not scratch glass, fairly soft mineral, halite, almost transparent translucent in this case, and so that's number five. We have to work our way around the dinosaur. And now we're gonna look at mineral number six. So mineral number six, important rock forming mineral. This is potassium feldspar, case bar. Good cleavage, salmon pink color. Case bar does not have striations. It does have growth lines on it. And people often confuse these linear features with striations, but these are not striations. Striations don't touch one another, and these little lines do touch. They do intersect one another. And so this mineral here is potassium feldspar, or better known as case bar. A very hard mineral, one that has a hardness of seven, scratches glass very easily. This is just plain, simply quartz. Now, if this quartz were purple in color, we would call it an amethyst. If it were pink in color, we call it rose quartz. If it was a dark color, a smoky color, we call it smoky quartz. But quartz is just like this, it's clear or white. We basically just call this crystalline quartz, and that's what this is. Quartz does form hexagonal prisms, but again, it forms prisms under heat and pressure when quartz is hit with an, a hammer, it fractures. So this is a good example of a mineral that does not have any cleavage, and this is fractured. And that's number seven. Moving on to number eight, 
very important feature to see on number eight, and that is right here. This mineral here has striations. And I'm trying to get into where we can actually see striations in the different light. But this mineral has actually straight lines. They're not showing up very well on the camera. So we'll try and do it like this. Still not getting the striations to show up on the camera. They are definitely there. You can barely make them out. But this metal does have striations. Nice straight lines. So number eight, the answer to number eight is plagioclase. And you can barely see striations in it. The camera's just not picking them up, doing justice to it. So that's plagioclase, feldspar. Number nine has a very greasy feel to it. You can tell by the paper. It's been marked on by the mineral. This mineral is very soft, fingernail soft. You can scratch your fingernail. This is graphite. It's made essentially out of carbon. The difference between graphite and a diamond is that diamonds are formed under heat and pressure. And graphite, which is also carbon, much like a diamond, is very soft. It easily writes on paper. And this is what they actually put in pencils. They don't put lead in pencils. They put graphite in pencils. And then number 10, the most heavy mineral, the most dense mineral that we have seen. This is galena. So we've got the silver mineral here. This is lead and sulfur, PBS. This is a chemical formula. Very heavy has a dark gray streak to it. And once you pick this thing up, this is heavier than pyrite. It's basically heavier, has a higher specific gravity, greater density than any mineral that we've seen. It often has cubic cleavage. So galena does form cubic cleavage. And so in this case, you can actually see a cube there. If you hit this with another object or a hammer, it'll definitely cleave in the cubes. All right, so that's the end of the minerals. Now we're going to go to igneous rocks. So the next 10 will be igneous rocks. Starting with number 11, very lightweight rock. Lots of really small holes in it. This rock is essentially glass, and it is basically the same composition as obsidian. The difference is, is that this was obsidian with a lot of gas in it. So the gas escaped. It expanded the rock. This rock will float on water. Very lightweight. And this is pumice. And the texture of this is called frothy. Number 12 is actually a piece of obsidian. This is volcanic glass. This is the rock that cooled the quickest the quickest of all the igneous rocks. Obsidian can generally be black in color. It can be brown, which we call, refer to as mahogany obsidian, or sometimes there'll be often little white specks in it, and we call that snowflake obsidian. So number 12, this is just plain obsidian. And by the way, obsidian is actually a felsic rock. It's quartz rich. It's dark color, tends to be a little confusing because it just took a small amount of iron to infiltrate into the matrix of this quartz to give it this dark color. But obsidian is actually felsic, it's quartz rich. And so this particular piece of obsidian here is probably 90% quartz, a little bit of impurity such as iron got into it. Moving on to number 13. This is a really interesting rock. This is typically what you see made out of countertops. In fact, this was actually came from a store that makes countertops. The texture of this rock is porphyritic. It's porphyry because there's one larger mineral in here, and that's the plagioclase. The other minerals, the dark mineral, the mica, the clear quartz, are much smaller in size. 
So the texture of this is porphyritic. It's a granite, so we call this a porphyritic granite. So number 13 is a porphyritic granite. Number 14 is also granite, but this is actually a red granite. And what gives us this red color is the potassium feldspar. So this is full of K-spar, potassium feldspar. You can also see the, the smoky quartz in here. And that basically is what we call a red granite. Moving on to number 15. This rock has two minerals in it. It is a white mineral, which is ampable. It has a black mineral, ampable, and a white mineral, which is plagioclase. So the white mineral on this rock is plagioclase, and the black mineral is ampable. And this rock is pretty close to being 50-50 distribution, so this is what we call an intermediate rock. It's not mafic, that means it's not iron-rich. It's also not felsic, meaning quartz-rich. It's right there in the middle. And this rock referred to as diorite. All right, moving on, number 16, we go all the way across the room here to finish up the igneous rocks. So number 16, very interesting rock. This is a very dark rock, but it has visible crystals. So the texture on this rock is phanoritic, visible minerals. So this phanoritic has visible minerals. It's also very mafic, which means it's dark, iron rich. Mafic rocks are iron rich. And this particular rock is called a gabbro. So this is a gabbro. Number 17, this is actually a basalt. And not only is it just a basalt, it's a vesicular basalt because it has lots of air holes in it. Now there's other basalts that don't have air holes and we just call them basalt. And so this is a mafic rock, it's rich in iron. And if this rock were to become metamorphosed, it would actually form a rock called amphibolite. So this is a metamorphic, metamorphic rock called amphibolite. And all these little teeny minerals you see in here are ampable crystals. Now imagine those ampable crystals that are in this metamorphic rock amphibolite are also in this vesicular basalt. But they're microscopic, we can't see them. So the texture of this rock is actually vesicular, meaning it has air holes. We also refer to this as scoria, so the two words, scoria and vesicular basalt, are interchanged. They're meaning the same thing. That refers to a basalt with a lot of air holes in it. And within this rock, it's mafic iron-rich minerals, especially ampable. And so, again, you metamorphose this rock, you put it under heat and pressure, it forms a new metamorphic rock called amphibolite. Okay, moving on to number 18. This is the coarsest grain igneous rock of all of them. This rock has very large minerals in it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this rock has mica minerals in it, mica variety, muscovite. It has some case bar in it and some quartz. And this is what we call a pegmatite. So pegmatite is the coarsest texture. So when you see a felsic rock, a quartz rich rock, light in color, with very large minerals, that texture is called pegmatite. Number 19. This texture is also porphyritic. And the reason it's porphyritic is because it has one large phenocryst, and that large phenocryst is ampable. This rock also has a little bit of olivine and some uh, pyroxene in it. So number 19, this is what we call a porphyritic basalt. 
And the green color of it kind of makes it look a little lighter in appearance, so some people want to call this intermediate. This is actually mafic, almost on the border of being ultra mafic. So the lightness of this rock, the lightness of the color, the deviation from a dark black color to more of a lighter green color is due to the mineral olivine, and olivine is kind of like an olive green color mineral. And so this is a porphyritic basalt. And then this rock here has what we call affinitic texture. No visible minerals in it whatsoever. So there's no visible minerals in this. This is an extrusive rock. It formed at the surface. The minerals that did not have time to cool. And this is what we call a rhyolite. So rhyolite. All right, now we're going to move on to sedimentary rocks, starting with number 21. This is a clastic rock. Clastic means it consists of fragments of other rocks. And because the clast, the gravel-sized clasts that make up this rock are square, angular in shape, we call this a breccia. So breccia is gravel size, angular or square fragments that make up this rock. So these are fragments and pieces of other rock that have been cemented back together. And close to the breccia is a rock that's more rounded. And the difference between the breccia and this rock, this is a conglomerate, is that the breccia consists of angular square fragments and the breccia is angular. This is not angular. These are actually round class. You can see they're pretty rounded. Even in this piece over here, you'll see that the class are more rounded, been more weathered. So this is what we call a conglomerate. The difference between the conglomerate and the breccia is simply that the breccia has angular class, the conglomerate has rounded. They're both gravel size. Number 23, this reacts to acid, so it's basically held together by calcite. And this is nothing but a bunch of broken shells, all kind of glued back together. And a rock that consists of broken shells, all glued back together, we call this coquina. So coquina basically is a bunch of shells, broken seashells that all one kind of basically cemented back together. Okay, we're going to move on to number 24 here. This rock is a clastic slash detrital sedimentary rock. Its green size is sand size. It's a sandstone. But we just can't call this rock a sandstone because it has this unique red color. And the uni unique red color is due to iron oxide or the mineral hematite. And that's what gives it the red color. So we call this a hematitic sandstone. Very fine grain sand. This is most likely wind blown. It was part of a sand dune at one time. This is part of the Aztec or the Navajo sandstones of the southwestern United States. And the red color is due to iron oxide or hematite. Number 25 is the most fine grain classic sedimentary rock that you're ever going to find. Layered rock. And this is basically a shell. Shells come in many colors. They can come in green, tan, brown, black, red. Shells are really an important sedimentary rock, especially with the fossil record. The color of the shell really tells about the environment in which those shells were formed. And so number 25 is a shell. Number 26, this is also a sandstone, quite different than number 24, the hematitic sandstone. This is a classic sedimentary rock, sand-sized grains in it, but this rock has larger pieces and chunks of potassium feldspar or case bar. And so because it has larger chunks of case bar in it, we call this sandstone an arcose sandstone. So this is an arcose sandstone. And it's due to the big fragments of potassium feldspar. Number 27, this is something that's you know, fairly straightforward. The main component that makes up this rock is carbon and some organic material, basically organic carbon. This is what we call a chemical or a biochemical rock. This is a rock that basically formed 
with the aid of water formed in a swamp, and this is what we call bituminous coal. So bituminous coal is more fragile. It breaks apart easily. As you can see, it went through the torture of a classroom, and it kind of got broken up a little bit. So this is what we call bituminous coal. It will burn. It's fairly soft. And so bituminous coal number 27. Number 28, it's mainly comprised of quartz. But this is the sedimentary versions of quartz. And these types of quartz are very unique. There's three of them. There's jasper, which is red in color. There's chert, which is kind of like the white to gray in color. And then flint. This rock doesn't have any other flint in it, so flint is black quartz. So these are all sedimentary varieties of quartz. The, this quartz basically took this tree, this part of a tree which was made out of wood, carbon-based, and kicked the carbon out and basically replaced the carbon with quartz, silicates. So you can see that the integrity of the bark is pretty well intact, but it's no longer bark. It's been actually replaced by quartz. And this big piece of petrified wood here is basically a piece of wood that was buried very quickly, put under a certain amount of pressure, and over millions of years, groundwater carrying in quartz replaced the carbon in the tree with quartz, and this is how petrified wood is formed. So number 28. Number 29, this is a chemical rock. This is formed in water, and since it reacts to acid, you know it's gonna be a calcite-based rock. And this is what we call limestone, but because this limestone has fossils in it, we call it phospholiferous limestone. So this is phospholiferous limestones. It has really distinctive fossils in it, oceanic fossils. And these are probably better looking over here. And so this is what we call Phospholiferous limestone, so number 29 is phospholiferous limestone. Number 30, I told you shells came in many, many colors. This is a very organic, rich shell, number 30. Nice layer. And so it has a nice layering to it. And the reason it's a brown in color, this has a lot of oil on it. So this is like an oil shell. And if you smell it, you can actually smell some of the oil on it. So number 30 is oil shell. So that ends the sedimentary rocks. And now we're going to go back across the room and we're going to look at the metamorphic rocks. Most students find the metamorphic rocks pretty straightforward and simple. So our first metamorphic rock is a piece of slate. Now slate can come in many different colors. It can come in red, black, green. And so here's a piece of red slate. We have a piece of darker slate here, a little bit lighter gray slate. So slate is a foliated metamorphic rock that doesn't have any visible minerals in it. It's the first in the metamorphic grade. So the metamorphic grade goes from slate the phyllite, the schist, to gneiss. And this is low-grade metamorphism, and this is a slate. Comes in many different colors. So if the parent rock of a slate is a shell. So if the shell was green, the slate's gonna be green. If the shell was red, the slate will be red, and so forth. Foliated metamorphic rock called a slate. And then the next step down in the metamorphic scale is number 32. This is a phyllite. So a phyllite, unlike the slate, which is dull, this has a little bit of a shine to it. And this camera doesn't want to really pick up the shine, but it definitely does have a shine to it, a little bit of a glossy sheen to it. And this is a phyllite. Phyllites also tend to have a little wavy texture to them. They've been subject to a little bit more temperature. And the reason they have a shine to them is the mineral quartz really tries to come out, but it still isn't visible to the human eye. 
So number 33, I'm going to come back to. I'm going to go to number 34 here. And this is the next step in the minimum grade. This is a rock called a schist. And the mineral that's present in this schist is a mica, the mica variety muscovite. So this is a schist, visible minerals. It's foliated. And then going back to number 33, this is the highest grade of metamorphism. This is a gneiss. And what makes a gneiss different is it has this layering look to it. So you can see the alternating colors of the black ampoule mineral and the pink case bar. And so this is the highest grade of metamorphism. And this is a gneiss. Going now to number 35. 35, very shiny, a little bit more compact than its sedimentary parent. This is what we call anthracite coal. And the difference between bituminous coal, which is sedimentary, and anthracite coal, which is metamorphic, is that the anthracite coal is almost pure carbon. The bituminous coal, the sedimentary variety, is softer, and it has a lot more sulfates in it. And when you burn it, it burns very dirty. This burns pretty clean. So the anthracite coal burns hotter, it burns cleaner. And this is actually on its way to being pure carbon. And if you were to compress this under heat and pressure, you could turn this old hunk of coal into a diamond because it's carbon. And it's almost a pure form of carbon, so this is anthracite coal. Number 36, its parent is a limestone. So this reacts to acid, which means it's calcite based. But unlike a limestone, this actually has a nice crystalline grain to it. So marble is limestone that's been put under heat and pressure. And the microscopic calcite minerals grew into larger minerals that we see here. And this is typically what we see of marble. So marble and quartzite, they look a lot alike. They can both be white, they can both be pink. The difference between the two is that marble is much softer, it will not scratch glass. And because it's calcite base, it's gonna to react to hydrochloric acid. So that's marble, number 36. Number 37. This is kind of a strange rock in the sense that it fits the foliation, but you don't see much foliation on this rock. It's a green color. I know the camera's not really picking up the green. And so a green rock that doesn't really have any foliation to it, we simply call this green stone. Really simple. Green rock, no foliation to it. You call this rock a green stone. So I'm going to skip over 38, and I'm going to go to another green rock that is very similar to this green stone. But the difference is, is that this one, number 39, actually has foliation to it, has a layering to it. So you can see the individual layers on this rock. Foliation. So this is a green schist. So the difference between a green schist and a green stone is that the green stone is basically massive. There's no layering to it. This rock actually has a layer into it. It has foliation to it. So it has distinctive layers. And these distinctive layers make this more of a true schist. So this is what we call green schist. If it doesn't have foliation, we call it green stone. So go back to number 38 here. This was its parent was a conglomerate or breccia. And so we take a sedimentary rock that's a conglomerate or a breccia, we metamorphose it, we put it under heat and pressure, it becomes a metaconglomerate. So, on, so like the parent, the conglomerate, it carried on part of the name, and we just put a meta on top of it, we call it metaconglomerate. And then the very last of the metamorphic rocks that we looked at 
is this one here. This composition of this rock is quartz. It will not react to acid. It will scratch glass. Its parent was a quartz sandstone. So quartz sandstones, the sedimentary rock, a quartz sandstone, when we metamorphose those, they become a rock called quartzite. And so this is a quartzite. So go ahead and play this video. You can pause it and go through these rocks. Next week when we actually do our midterm exam for lab, mineral, and rock identification, the layout's going to be just like this. Some of those samples might be the same. I might substitute other ones. So study your old labs. Go over this video a few times. And good luck on the rock, mineral, and rock identification midterm.